Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Matthew Dorman. Matthew is the CEO of Touchwood Labs, uh, a company that digitizes wooden furniture in a pretty cool way. Matthew, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. Good to have you. I, I know we've been talking about doing it for a while. I appreciate you coming on and making time. Well, my pleasure. Yeah, cool. So uh, last time we talked, I learned a little bit more about the origins of your office and not to like go right into it, but I, it was a story I'd never heard before. So, uh, yeah, um, it, it is, I guess, an interesting story. So it, it started with my previous business, which was a, a furniture design and manufacturing business. I, I needed a space to set up shop and have uh, you know, room for equipment and office and all that. And locally to me, I was able to find a, a church that was for sale, an old church building. Um, and I was able to purchase that and converted it into a woodworking shop. So we, we had about 4,000 square feet per floor, <laughs> two floors, uh, freestanding. Uh, subsequently, I licensed that business, but uh, you licensed maintained the shop. I did, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, my awesome. former employee. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. My, my former employee's taking that over. Um, but I still have the, uh, the shop itself. And due to the pandemic and everything, we actually kind of did some renovations. And now this is a live works space, live work, build, pray. <laughs> <laughs> Back to its praying roots. I guess. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's uh, so when you started to show it to me the other day, I was like, oh, yeah, I could see how that would have been like a priest's quarters. So. Right. Yeah. So my office itself was the uh, like the priest's room. Uh, all of these shelves were all like labeled or the drawers, they were all labeled, you know, candles and whatever stuff like uh, that you would find. <laughs> you got it, all of that. Um, and so actually it was kind of fun uh, when I had employees here and when we were doing furniture making, you know, my I, my employees could say, my boss is a Jewish carpenter, and we work in a church. So. <laughs> Pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Back to uh, back to the roots, as they say. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so yeah, so what kind of stuff is Touchwood working on? I guess just for uh, for people listening that might not have heard of heard of it yet, and I don't know if there's like sure. a video we could play uh, that would make sense to splice in. After the fact, I mean, definitely, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if you definitely. Yeah. Um, so essentially, what we uh, are doing at Touchwood is finding ways to turn opaque materials that we find in our surfaces of our everyday objects, so things like wood or stone, plastic, painted walls, and turn those into interactive digital displays and touch interfaces. So essentially, you can imagine the surface of your desk coming to life when you need to access it or your door or your wall and then uh, having that disappear when it's not needed so it just goes back to being its natural material so right now we are we're working with uh, a few different companies on some different uh, development product development uh, uh, projects for in introducing this into the market in a couple of different couple of different ways can't really talk a whole lot about the details on no those worries, right now yeah. but uh, pretty soon yeah. still seems pretty cool i like the idea of coming to life um while you need it and then going back to what right. it's for because i feel like um i don't know i mean i'm sure you talk about this all the time but just as uh you know kind of more of a lay person to touch wood um I don't know. I feel like I've got my phone in front of me like a little too much. And if it wasn't always a phone, that might be nice, you know, to could kind of hide away. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. I don't know that we're necessarily solving for the phone. The phone is definitely overused, right? Like it's, it's the Swiss army knife of the digital world, <laughs> right? Like when it first came out in uh, whatever it was, 2010, you know, it came with like five apps and there was a handful available in the app store. But now everything in the world is like coming through your phone, calling for your attention. And we're doing it to ourselves, right? We have screens everywhere. Every device has a screen or an input of some sort. So now if you can imagine removing the need for the traditional black glass slab that's just slapped onto a surface, now we can have a more... Uh, 
a, a cleaner design aesthetic um, and just eliminate the, you know, that constant draw of your attention uh, by eliminating that, that the screen itself. So how did you figure out, uh, like, what made you think to do this, I guess? Because it's, I don't know, it's, it's non-traditional. I guess when I saw your first demo, it kind of came alive for me a lot more than just when I heard the pitch. Right, so right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so a few years ago, as, as I mentioned previously, I was running a, a furniture design and manufacturing business, and I, I was kind of growing tired of it, and I wanted to do something different. I always had a, a love for technology and for kind of tinkering and robotics, and I wanted to find a way to combine those two passions of, you know, what can we do together with the digital world and the physical world of natural materials, specifically, yeah. you know, architectural materials. And so I, I kind of dropped what I was doing here and decided to go back to grad school um, and explore that. So I went to, to CMU and specifically, you know, kind of looking for ways to integrate those two things. I took a number of courses on designing for IoT and uh, just kind of started experimenting with materials and LEDs to get, uh, you know, some sort of like, if I can get one pixel to display, then that's one <laughs> piece of information. And if I can get 10 pixels, that's 10 pieces of information that I can display or control. But now on our, our displays, we have 65,000 pixels. That's pretty cool. <laughs> We've come a long way. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. Just to, to ask, like, how it works a little bit, um, is that something you can talk about at all, or is that, like, more of, like, a secret? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yep, yeah. So uh, we do have a, a U.S. Uh, utility patent and international patents pending. Sweet. So essentially what we're doing is um, combining high-intensity LEDs with uh, some proprietary materials and layers, additional uh, projected capacitive touch sensor, the same type that you would find on an iPhone or an iPad. And all of this we can mount beneath the surface of many architectural materials. Natural materials like wood or stone will allow um, some light to, to pass through. So we use very high intensity LEDs to, to, to do that. That's pretty cool. So you've basically got a veneer mounted toward the front of like a, a touch screen basically, but otherwise you're sort of recreating that traditional touch screen. Basically. Yeah. Does that have to be, um, I guess, is that, is that a custom touch screen element, uh, to, to work within your process or can you retrofit to an existing? So, <laughs> um, we're using uh, in, in, like your traditional touch screen is using LCD, uh, backlit LCD, or sometimes OLED now. Uh, the, the types of LEDs that we're using, they're, they're literally the same types that are in the like advertising billboards outside. So they're, they're super bright. Okay. Um, and so they generate a lot of uh, electromagnetic interference. And so we reduce that by using a proprietary insulation layer that still allows light to pass and actually in the insulation layer we can utilize uh, micro lenses to kind of focus uh, the light as well so that it doesn't diffuse by the time it gets to the surface sweet all right so pretty much like a whole new thing that's it's never really existed yeah yeah i mean a lot of the same elements that you'll find in in touch screens but reconfigured or, or done in a different way to accommodate for the materials that's cool so how do you go about having something like that made i guess uh you know i guess out of the gate just it wouldn't even know where to go for that as someone that's never done it before um mm -hmm. how what did that journey look like to to try to find manufacturing partners for for a device like that right well uh probably not like the best question per se because we don't have a, a product that we're producing oh, it's sorry. more of a uh it's all good but um in terms of producing the prototypes i mean that the initial ones uh, i built those from from scratch built the built the sensor from scratch um eventually i was able to utilize some off-the-shelf componentry some kind of standard ic's for projected capacitive touch sensors 
and the touch sensors we have them custom made um, specific to the uh, the display sizes that we're using which are quite large so the, i'm working on one right now it's uh 640 no six, yeah 640 by 480 millimeters so oh, it's wow. about two foot That's by three foot pretty pretty massive yeah. Mm, yep. Um, and then the, the and touch sensor, that's like a whole grid that goes over the front, basically? Or? Kind of, yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually, we've developed a way that we can use the CNC machine to print the sensor on, on the material. Oh, cool. Um, using nanowires, basically. Uh, so they, it, it, have you ever seen like a drag knife operation on a, a CNC? Um. Like I, I've cutting seen vinyl it before, or leather on like, like a vinyl plotter. Um, yeah, I've not seen it implemented Same. on like a CNC mill, but I, you mean like a CNC yeah, so vinyl plotter? Exactly same same type of operation, but instead of a knife, it's you can just picture a little spool of wire, right? So it's just dragging cool. that that spool. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. All right, yeah, so clearly yeah, there's cool. a lot about this tech I don't know yet. So um, it's all good. Yeah, with the wire. Um, does do you just have multiple traces and then when you go between them that's what is perceived as capacitive touch how does how do those sensors work exactly i guess just trying to find a good entry point here uh, and you know if it's not the sure. best question i mean yeah no I, if you want i can i've got a, a sensor right here i can kind of show you this is actually stuck to the back of my door but all right so here's part of our sensor and I don't know if you can actually see, you can't see, but the traces are so small you can't see. So here's all, all the traces running along the edge and then they break down uh, perpendicular okay, to that. You really see can't the edge. see. It's hard to see the, the grid coming down vertically. Yeah, yeah, so tiny. Um, but so they all come to uh, this little ribbon cable here, which which plugs into the IC, but um, as, essentially the uh, the way that capacitive touch works is that uh, your body will, your body is conductive and this is generating a, a slight electromagnetic field that when you come in contact with it, you shunt, uh, you shunt some of that, that field, right? So your, your yeah. body is essentially like acting like a ground. And so that's detected, um, the, the variations in capacitance are, de are detected by the uh, the chip, depending on which electrodes uh, uh, are are interacting. The the chip will, will make those calculations. That makes sense. So it basically yeah. just senses you're like here and here, and then it's essentially yeah like yeah. So line. we yeah yeah. So we actually um, there's on, on on this particular sensor there's only. Only there's about a hundred electrodes, um, and but with that we're able to get uh, over sixteen thousand kind of touch pixels on on the on the area. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, I mean, this is going to sound bad because I don't know what the math is exactly, but I'm guessing so many of those are like X, and so many of those are Y, and then you look for collisions basically and. That's how you're able to get a touch pixel. Yeah, essentially. So, um, you can draw it out right here. Yeah, cool. Uh... So the way that the electrodes are are arranged, they're they're kind of uh, in these like uh, wave patterns. Oh, cool. So that's like the x direction, and then the y direction. Sorry, I've got that backwards. X and y. So instead of a traditional it grid, it, like, it, it looks like a mess of, of yarn. But because of the way that they overlap like that, like if I touch here, uh, it's, gonna, it's going to be detected by more than one electrode. It's going to be about nine, nine or 12 different electrodes. And so that'll give me, you know, kind of a different reading on, I've got three electrodes on, on the X and three on the Y that, you know, I'll get a different reading on these, but it'll know that it's closer to this one. And as a result, you know, it, it gets quite pinpoint accuracy. That's pretty awesome. So is the point of yeah. that wavy pattern then just to be able to pack more pixel density into like a smaller area or? 
Um, so, uh, uh, like compared to a traditional grid, right? Like if yeah. if I had the same number of electrodes, right? If I touch here, really only one one electrode in this uh, is going to provide that reading. Whereas over here, like uh, I'm much more likely to come into contact with multiple. So. Okay, so the math is a little bit more complicated, but you've got better density in any point. <laughs> yeah, better density. Yeah, exactly. More surface area. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to explain it to me. By the way, I really sure, am sure. Person. No, I, I, if you got me at the beginning of the day, it would have been a much smoother, better explained explanation. No worries. Um, so yeah, no, it's all good. Just interested. Um, mm. So, what is some of the demos you've got? Uh, can you show anything or uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot if you can't. Um, I, <laughs> well, behind me, I've got two tables that uh, this one has a, a concrete finish and this one is a uh, Corian. It's like a kitchen countertop material. Oh, sweet. Uh, they are, they're both functional touchwood prototypes. However, I took the computer out <laughs> that runs them <laughs> in, in, in the new functional prototype that I'm working on right now. Nice. Um, have you noticed that raspberry pies, you, you can't find them. And when you can, like a $50 pie is now $200 plus. I should start selling all my raspberry pies on eBay. If that's the case, it's Are they crazy. Really up to that much? Yeah. Yeah. 200. You go to Amazon, $200. If you want a, a four gigabyte Shit. raspberry four. Yeah, yeah. I've got a, I've got a couple of pie fours on, on the bench at home. Well, if, uh, if you need a raspberry. Send them my four, way. I need them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might be. I might have an extra one in a 3D printer. I I scrapped a while ago. Text me. Text me after this. <laughs> Will do. Sell it to you somewhere between market and and eBay. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> or yeah, I'll just give it to you if you give me one later. I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I think I got one. Yeah, it's wild. But yeah, story of like every startup I've ever owned or, or worked with, right, is like you have a limited number of resources. You've got an unlimited amount of stuff that needs to be done tomorrow. And so, you know, you just end up yep. swapping the guts from like demos into other demos just to make that all work. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Been, been there. Yeah. And if I'm not there, I'm probably doing something wrong. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It means I'm not working. <laughs> so, yeah, cool. So let's see. Um, so what are some of the other interesting things you've kind of had to do uh, for Touchwood recently uh, that just might not occur to some of the people listening if they haven't had like a product startup or, I mean, I don't know. The technology is novel. I, I don't think anybody but you knows <laughs> your exact journey. Yeah. But, well, I, I think, you know, one of our, uh, challenges has from the beginning has been uh, this is it's really it's an enabling technology as opposed to a product per se. So if we were developing you know a product that we were looking to get to market and sell at whatever Best Buy, that that would be a very different approach than developing a technology that we're looking to uh, either partner with or license to existing product manufacturers or uh or we're the next startup for that matter yeah, we're actually right now we're, we're working with uh, uh as i mentioned earlier a couple of different uh product uh development uh projects one of which is with a a company out of out of the netherlands that uh, we, we were able to identify they're utilizing projection technology um projection and uh computer vision you know cool. to, to project surfaces uh, um, to, to project their tech, their software onto surfaces. Uh, and this is a, a natural uh, replacement for that for them. So they're very excited about this. But uh, it's been an interesting process because every, uh, you know, potential partner or every potential customer has, has a different need, different application, different requirements for resolution, brightness, the surface material itself. Uh, and so when we go into these conversations, uh, we have to be open and flexible. Uh, and we also have to be able to, you know, adapt and, and learn. 
Um, and so it's, it's been fun and, and exciting and I've, I've learned a lot along the way. That makes a lot of sense to me. Is there, I guess, a point at which you decided that you weren't going to be a product company and, and you sort of steered Touchwood more in the direction of being, you know, like an enabling tech company or did you always know that that was going to be a better way to do it? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I would say for the first part of our journey, uh, we went through a, a local hardware startup accelerator and we were very much encouraged from the beginning to like, you know, product and customer discovery. What's your product? Who are you selling to? And, you know, so we really, we spent a lot of time kind of thinking about and, and looking at use cases and saying, okay, this is a great use case. This does solve a problem. Can we make a product? Should we make a product? Is that big enough? And um, there are a few instances where we definitely could have become a specific product company, uh, which I, I don't know if we would have been any better off than we are now. But um, what were some of those instances, if I can ask, where you said, you know, this seems like fun, but maybe it's not for us as, as a mainstay? Well, I, um, I, I don't think I'll go into the details because no, we're understand. talking with, uh, I think one of the things that switched for us is, you know, we were looking at one particular use case and realized that kind of one of our biggest hurdles would be the, the existing competition out there. Got and it. it just made sense to us that this is really something that they should be doing as opposed to us trying to do it better than them. And so, you know, now we're, we're still kind of in conversations with them and through this long, you know, circular route, but, uh, you could have been competitors. <laughs> now, you know, now you know, some, friend. <laughs> there's something to be said about, uh, you know, industry leading companies, uh, they, they're industry leaders for a reason. And you also see a lot of these companies making acquisitions and, and licensing deals you know, to help keep them on the top. And uh, this is, I think, more of the route that we want to take is enabling a lot of these great companies out there to, to make better products. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to you me. Know, with our technology, yeah. Yeah, I know, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, I guess when I was growing up, like pre-career, but still aspiring to it, a lot of times, I mean, I, I just would think of like B to C because, you know, that's all I knew about because I was, you know, mm. not in B. I was just, you know, a C. <laughs> so I um, I don't know. Like it, all my ideas as a kid were like B to C, B to C, B to C. And then mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, like when you start getting exposed more to just like business to business relationships, like that starts to become apparent, you know, how much you can do that way. And so... I guess that kind of makes sense to me that, you know, it's just like, well, there's this whole other world that, you know, we're not even being exposed to by this incubator or that, you know, wouldn't conventionally occur to you if you're just trying to pigeonhole it into a single product. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me, right? That seems like a better way to bring that technology alive because you're, you know, keeping a lot of avenues open and, you know, you're not putting the onus on you to create complete products and, you know, I mean, your probability of it seeing the light of day, I feel like, is much higher that way because you've got more more avenues to get there. What are what are some of your challenges at the moment? Like some of the things that you know, you sort of scratch your head on when you're going to bed, and sometimes you have an answer when you wake up, and sometimes you're like, "Well, got to think about that more." But you know, this once we solve that. Yeah. Set, so I mean, like, hey, you know, any any business is going to have lots of challenges out yeah, of on the on the physical side of, of like manufacturing and, and design um there's a, a number of things that i'm looking to improve where the feedback that we've received from customers is always uh can it be brighter better clarity uh, better response uh, all of these things so um, and that's uh, an improvement improvements that we're constantly working on so like i said that I've got a, a larger panel out there that I've been working on uh, with a very high uh, resolution, uh, much smaller pixels than we've used in, in the past. So we're nice. getting some beautiful clarity. And it's very exciting. Yeah. Um, and then on the, the business side, I think, 
you know, we all have been through the, uh, the past year, uh, which is, it's caused a lot of slowdown. So some things that we expected to happen right. within a certain time period just got stretched and stretched. And, uh, so those are the types of challenges that we deal with, especially with, um, you know, talking with a lot of the more global corporations, they just, they move so slow to begin with that, uh, this past year has been a little slow <laughs> uh, in, in getting things done the way that uh, that we expected. Amen to that. Is that one of the reasons you decided to make your own uh, touchscreen element, or do you think you would have done that anyway, just to have like rapid iteration? Because I feel like that's one of those. I guess the reason I initially asked you, you know, like, what does it take to make that, is because it wouldn't even occur to me that you could make that yourself. <laughs> I, I would mm. just think that is so magical and beyond my comprehension. Obviously, you're going to have that made. And in that factory, I mean, they might have, you know, elves. They might have smurfs. I don't know how they're making <laughs> it, but they've got some kind of yeah. maybe dragon's breath. You know, they've got some kind of a, yeah. a magical <laughs> formula. And then just, you know, touch touch screens come out the other side. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, this is uh, with our needs. It's been super low volume. We're just basically making prototypes and samples and display units, uh, demo units. So uh, a dozen, two dozen at a time at max. So, yeah. uh, But if uh, knock on wood, touch wood, if this uh, <laughs> next project goes off without, without a hitch, uh, we could be looking at uh, exciting numbers, very exciting. That's numbers. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, just smoking cool that you even figure out how to do that in the first place like I, I again i'm boggled that i know how sort of how a touch screen works now <laughs> <laughs> so i guess what are do you have any do you have any personal projects you're working on right now um any uh oh like outside of touchwood yeah. or uh, yeah i'm actually I'm, I'm in the process of building a guitar it's kind of fun. Do you do you still have the ability to put the cat of that up? I'd be curious to uh, to explore that a little I, bit more. The cat, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you don't have to, but I I don't know if it'll if it'll translate nicely. But yeah, one minimize myself here. That is the neck. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty cool. Is that is that Fusion three sixty? It is. Yeah. Nice not worked with that as much but it seems like it gives you better control over colors than uh than solidworks does uh yeah they let you uh apply appearances pretty well so yeah this is uh this is it nice. hold on i get one more piece of the model here uh yeah so i'm actually um uh, i just started machining some of the components the other day but nice the, the it's a hollow body and the the inside i'm uh, lining with uh, or laminating with uh, carbon fiber uh to to stiffen it um as well as provide um both a ground plane for the electronics and uh shielding for uh, electromagnetic interference does that mean you're so, gonna have like the same kind of touch wood interface on this <laughs> uh, not on this iteration yeah <laughs> Fair uh, this is kind of a, an interesting thing is uh, oftentimes in uh, hollow uh, hollow body guitars and, and acoustic guitars especially you'll see uh, these types of I guess like ribs uh, that are in there for for support that are they're usually glued in after the fact but because I'm cutting this on the CNC I, I can essentially leave that as uncut material uh, nice. So you're making uh, this out of neat. one big chunk of wood, basically, or a couple of big chunks of wood. And yeah. And made together. Yep, exactly. That's pretty awesome. I've got some of the test cuts right out here if you want to see yeah, one. Yeah, it'd be cool to see. All right, hold on. Yeah, so I still have a lot of the um, equipment from woodworking, but uh, we use a, a vacuum press, vacuum lamination press. So. Oh, nice. This is just cut out of plywood, just to kind of test the uh, test the, the tool paths of the CNC. But, but you got uh, the back the, piece the top. pressed on there. It looks so like. this is the top, yeah. Um, so it'll be three, essentially three pieces: the top, the back, and, and then the, the middle. 
you have to rivet that in place or does that just all get glued into there like the um so i'm leaving a, a glue you know a fresh wood surface for for gluing and getting a, a good wood, wood to wood contact but nice but everything exposed on the inside will be covered in the carbon fiber that's awesome yeah i think it's kind of cool <laughs> how'd you get the carbon fiber to made on there like that i mean that's a really beautiful layup um so it's a fabric uh when you when you order it as a um you know uh, raw material uh, it's very very thin so one layer of carbon fiber uh like your typical 3k two by two twill um it, it's only going to be eight or nine thousandths of an inch thick so wow. uh, you lay that down kind of apply the epoxy it'll stick and then uh you vacuum bag and sucks all the air out sucks right down to the surface that's cool, and that's what gets you your weight reduction because that knocks out some of the resin that you'd otherwise have to put to get that. Uh, yep, yep, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah, that is that is super cool looking. Um, and then to get those little um, cutout shapes also in the carbon fiber, did you just have to follow that with like a knife after it was done, or how did which, you? Which this here? I guess the pattern that, that the uh, the openings are made from. Uh, like, oh, how, these? yeah, how did you get those in the, in the carbon fiber or does that, oh, I cut, I cut it, cut it right through. So I laid up the carbon fiber and then I cut it again. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So on the CNC. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. yeah. Sweet. No, that's, uh, that is clever. Yeah. I, I didn't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen anybody do it before. I've seen carbon fiber guitars, but not just lining on the inside and, and doing it that way. So. Yeah, I, I know nothing about guitars, but I've never seen anything done that way. So that's, yeah, it's very cool. So what are, what are the advantages of carbon fiber over just say like wood in that particular? I like okay. So the strength makes sense because you've got some like yeah. spindly pieces there that would be delicate if it was mm -hmm. if it was just plywood. Um, but then you start mentioning acoustics. Like how does that? And yeah, so it, it's. This is uh, the first time I've done it, and it's a complete experiment. So we'll see. Um, from instruments that I've seen and played before that were built entirely out of carbon fiber, they really have this very uh, full sound. Um, and, and so I'm curious about combining the two, uh, you know, combining the carbon fiber with the wood, which sound is going to be more predominant or <laughs> or will it be a complete wash and it's just gonna make it dead? I I don't know. I don't know. Like we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't pick a lane. <laughs> could be. It could be. It could be. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm excited to find out. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. It's interesting too, just to see like a design that doesn't emphasize the carbon. I feel like a lot of times, like acoustic. Uh, sorry visually like carbon fiber is kind of like your attention gets called to it because it's expensive and just labor intensive i guess uh and kind of mm. hard to do um and so people want to show off the fact that it exists in their design at all what i like about your design is that you've hidden the carbon fiber right. pretty much completely <laughs> so you wouldn't know it's there unless you know yeah, yeah. yeah you can poke see it through the little holes it'll, it'll be uh, just a nice little small design feature yeah yeah for sure but i mean it's like clearly like a lot of work is going into that teeny little accent that you'd barely see unless you you know yeah well i i, I guess this kind of really goes back to what we were talking about before is like combining natural materials with technology and and this is uh, i think another way of doing that yeah. touche <laughs> yeah well that's that's a good point did you ever do any of that kind of stuff with your work in like what like more traditional robotics? Because you were with the Field Robotics Center as like a systems engineer for mm -hmm. a bit, weren't you? That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I, I did build a robot out of wood. Yeah, <laughs> I had. Yeah, finally uh, that effort wooden, seemed wooden wooden get some get some some life out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think what did other. Uh... Like the one I started to build, where George Cantor told me not to. I George what did Cantor made me promise not to build a, a wooden robot. I started to build. Yeah. Do I want to know? So, I'm trying to think if I should tell this on on the air. Um. I'll I'll tell you in private. Okay. <laughs> after, after the thing. Okay. 
Sounds good. But I, I, but I started to build a wooden robot and then was told not to. So. Mm. <laughs> um, I think I did a lot of fabricating and, and building of things while I was at the um, BRI. And, um, I think being able to approach uh, machine shop tools from uh, from a background of being like a, a craftsman, um, I, I guess, I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, <laughs> no, it's all good. I mean, I, I think I'd asked if you ever incorporated like natural material into a robot. So, I yeah. mean, I, I think it's, it's a pretty fair game answer. <laughs> um, yeah, no, nothing on the, nothing on the, a lot of the big projects. Just that one, the one time that I, I made a wooden chassis for the robot. That's cool. but, would that have been like an early proof of concept or like just like a layout or was that something that actually got incorporated? Yeah, I'll, I'll shoot you a video afterwards. Yeah, cool. uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that that was, we painted it black so you couldn't tell, but uh, it was supposed to be for the prototype. Um, and it was so solid that it just didn't make any sense to go back and redo it out of aluminum. <laughs> Even though that was the original plan was to, to do it out of aluminum, but that was... I built it quick, you know, because I could do that with uh, with plywood. Yeah, plywood's uh, awesome. But but I also I used quality materials and I built them well, and so the finished product was just as good as it needed to be. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, I, I I joked about you know one that we started to build and then never finished because uh, of that thing with yeah. George Cantor. But um, I don't know if we should beep George Cantor's name here. But, uh, <laughs> Carl, you decide. But um, it's um, basically I um, I did work on a um, I guess it was wood and fiberglass and Kevlar uh, composite boat hull um, for uh, being able to hang an eighty kilogram mass spectrometer off of in that wood shop. Oh, cool! Yeah, um, and so there was it was eighth inch ply underneath everything for the form, and then it was. Mm -hmm. um, I think two layers of fiberglass on top of that for like the main holes and then okay. Kevlar over the keel so you could drag it up onto, you know, rocks or sand without abrading awesome. through your hull. Yeah. Yeah. So that was kind of fun. I mean, that was, that was a neat, a neat wood project that yeah. ended up being a robot. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I felt, I don't know when they were cleaning up a few years ago, I remember there was like the, uh, carbon fiber boat that got sawed in half as part of like just a regular house and it might have been like five or six years ago now uh, uh, but there was there was one uh time. yeah like grad student that was like oh, i had to saw that boat in half he was real sad <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's a beautiful piece of carbon fiber and i had to i had to take the sawzall to it it's kind of how his, his day had gone yeah what were other, what were some of the other things you worked on in terms of robotics that were kind of fun and uh yeah um we worked on the uh the darpa sub t uh the subterranean uh robotics challenge uh that was that was pretty cool we um we got to compete against uh all the the top names in robotics in the world uh right here in in pittsburgh and then Sweet. also we got to fly out to uh uh, to Seattle, uh, part of the competition, we had to build autonomous robots that uh, would navigate mines, caves, and tunnels, uh, search for survivors and specific artifacts. That's awesome. Uh, so each competition was different. Uh, so the one in Pittsburgh was obviously uh, uh, mines, right? So we had the uh, old abandoned coal mine um, in Seattle. Uh, we were out, outside of Seattle at a, an abandoned nuclear facility that was used as like a simulation for an underground urban environment, I think like subway tunnels and things oh, like that. Oh, that's interesting. And that was pretty wild. I feel like normally you'd go the other way, like you'd have access to a subway tunnel and that would be like the nuke facility for your movie set or whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> Interestingly, that this... Um, so this particular facility was never completed. It was like very close to being completed, like at the very final stage. Um, but I, I forget how many, how many 
hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Jeez. But it, it's used for uh, for movie sets now. So it's been in, I think it was in the Transformers movie or, or something else too. Nice. Wolverine or something. Yeah, it's uh, cool. Any good movies? No, just kidding. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> something. Yeah, so that was one uh, and one project. Passed on it. Um, I was on a, a bunch of different projects. Um, some of the other interesting ones uh, we did. Um, I designed a, uh, a. Are you familiar with a, a Delta style robotic arm? Uh, from like a three D printer, like the one with the hangy yeah. downy boys, where you exactly dangle different exactly amounts. yeah yeah yeah. So cool. um, I designed a kind of a, a different variation of that that used. Uh, linear actuators but they were um uh very very cool um uh very very cool motors it, it wasn't your t- typical ball screw right this was um uh, just a direct linear so just in, <laughs> super super fast super smooth positioning but uh using three of those and then also um rotational axis at the top uh you, you could produce a uh, an arm that would really kind of move to any coordinate in, in a much larger uh, workspace than what a, uh, a typical uh, delta arm configuration would do. Well, that's pretty cool because so of the that speed was you being get used. Linears. Yeah, yeah, um, and so that was being used for uh, electronic waste um, recycling from electronic components for sorting and separating. Oh, cool! Uh, that was very cool. Uh, we did some stuff with food, uh, food robotics. Uh, this was pretty cool. We got to go visit the the CIA, uh, the, the Culinary Central Institute Cul- oh, in nice. America, <laughs> <laughs> uh, up in That's New York. CIA. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. <laughs> and That's, uh, yeah, we set up uh, uh, set up a, a bunch of uh, real sense cams um, and used both motion tracking and sensors that we installed in a uh, cutting board and in the knife handle itself to uh, kind of watch and, and learn um, the, the actions required for different uh, like culinary applications for chopping and slicing vegetables. Oh, sweet. Uh, is there a robot at the of... other end of this or is there? Well, so this initial one was kind of more for the data collection, right? Uh, uh, and there's kind of a lot, a lot that needs to be done on that the front end before that can be translated that into uh, the robotic end. But, but there are a lot of interesting food robots out there I'm right sure now. You've got some smoking hot culinary students at CIA too that are like pretty amazing with a knife. Where if you could replicate that, I mean, you'd have a robot that's better oh, the, than me. The food was really good. <laughs> they served <laughs> us there. That's awesome. It was amazing. Yeah. I got I got a buddy that's going there now, and I tried to visit a while ago, and I think there was like some campus dining thing you recommended, but it was pandemic, so I couldn't do it. And kind of biggest regret of my life is what I'm trying to say, Matt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'm jealous, jealous of that. There's some cool ones though. Like there was, I, I was seeing there was some company I think Hyphen that looked like they were doing like a Chipotle robot sort of thing if i'm remembering correctly mm-hmm. there's there's a few in that space right now that have been sort of interesting to follow um mm. and i feel like that's that's a space that's kind of i don't know I, I haven't seen like any i mean there's not like a like a roomba of that space that i know of yet but i feel like whoever like sort of gets in there first i mean that's going to be huge yeah well there's a flip when you get a chance google flippy He's the, the hamburger flipping robot. Um, is that in use but, currently, like in like McDonald's and stuff? Or uh, not in McDonald's, but I think it's there's a, a few small chains like up in Silicon Valley that are, are using it. That's interesting. There's a, obviously a lot more like real world stuff happening there than than nationwide right now. But yeah, it makes sense. Uh, and it's funny, like everything is being designed and and built, and the technology is coming out of Pittsburgh, but. The money is all in Silicon Valley, so that's where it's. Yeah, it's been that way as long as I can remember. Coming out first, yeah, yeah. Or like I don't know. It seemed like there were Pittsburgh startups that were funded by um, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, 
Well, there still are. I mean, there's a bunch of them right now. Mm -hmm. But it seems like they're not trying to commercialize their first necessary. Well, I guess it's different with consumer facing. Um, Like something where you can see, you know, like, hey, this is our, you know, flag in the ground to show we're here first. You know, this technological milestone that everyone's going to see, maybe we'll launch that in the Bay Area first. Whereas I guess the stuff that like nobody sees, because so I'm thinking of our our friend's uh, water filter company that got funded from like Bay Area investors and they asked, um, you know, um, do you want us to relocate to the Bay Area when they got the money? I, I think it was like low seven figures. And the investor said, what, so you can spend it faster? Like, no, stay in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I feel like I've heard that story a few times now where, you know, like Bay Area backers um, and Seattle backers as well have, you know, invested in Pittsburgh companies, but encouraged them to keep the spend local. But mm. I guess I haven't, you know, I mean, I'm obviously biased. I live in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so. Yeah, it makes makes sense that some of it would just make its way back out there. Who who else are you following these days in terms of just interesting startups? So Flippy, that seems worth hmm. checking out. <laughs> Your knowledge is more current than mine. Oh, um, maybe six months ago. I, I think for the for the past six months, we've been really just so uh, focused on these product development projects that that, um, that as a startup, I, I, I guess I don't know admitting this to the world but uh you know as a startup half the job of your uh, ceo is to do fundraising constantly non-stop and uh, as a very small startup uh, it's a tough balance and so we've been just focused on building delivering and and discovering uh that there's been very little focus on the fundraising side so i've been Makes kind sense. of out of the out of the vc world uh, for probably six months now so you have to sort of go into it like in waves and so you raise basically for as long as you need to to get the money you need to run your business and then you just detach <laughs> and <clears throat> you know spend the money diligently and then you raise again when you need to and that's when you're back in that world sort of and then uh, that's one way to do it um Fair yeah enough. i think probably the the better way is uh, always have uh one foot in that water and one foot in the you know, gotta be straddling both worlds so. fair i'm trying to figure it out as someone that's not there <laughs> so, yeah, yeah yeah that makes sense to me yeah because I, I think every startup you know ceo and and i mean founder you know that i've met for the most part has talked about having to raise i mean and that's just a huge part of that existence um right so uh, makes sense but yeah i mean whether it's full time or, or half time i guess that's that's pretty wild though that like your whole com company uh function at times is just getting money so that you can continue to run your company right <laughs> <laughs> not not super healthy but uh that's how it works a lot of, yeah, I mean, a lot of the time. Reality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, I don't know, I mean, like, it's it's interesting, too. Like, do you do you have, like, um, I guess, do you do you go back to, like, the same nucleus of investors? Or do you have, like, a just a wider sort of net where it's, it's a lot of institutions with, like, a little bit invested or they're, like, high net worth individuals that you've built a personal relationship with or some combination of both? Yeah, I mean, we've been uh, we've been really lucky. We were um, go going through the Alpha Lab Gear, like, startup program. That was definitely a blessing for us. Um, that we were the, in the, the cohort that happened during the pandemic, so it was the first okay. time that they had done, like, a remote cohort. Um, but the, through that, we, we were able to get introductions to uh, all of the above. And then we were actually selected by TechCrunch, uh, to compete on the stage at, uh, TechCrunch Disrupt in, in 2020. And we said we were one of 20, 20 companies picked, uh, worldwide. And that got us in front of a lot of other, a lot of other people all around the world. So. Yeah, we've got um, 
a, a handful of really great uh, uh, people that we've been working with in Pittsburgh itself, and then conversations with uh, people all around the world. Any any other kind of uh, interesting projects? I mean, obviously the guitar seems like I don't know, a couple of things I couldn't do on that that I can think of. I feel like a lot of the stuff I was doing for like work work um, was a little bit too, um, not too, but I mean, there's joy in it, but it was a lot more formalized. Like I, I don't know, like everything had to be, you know, run through, you know, a peer review and, you know, certain procedures and it wasn't, didn't really feel as creative after a while. So, uh, so many, so many of the things that I've done or built or made in my life has just been like, you, you, you get an idea and you just want to try it out just to see if it'll work. And sometimes the results are not great. And sometimes the results are, you know, unexpectedly better than, than, uh, than what you were hoping for. And so you'll never know until you try. And, and yeah, uh, that's we'll look at it. Like the, the fun part is the, the making and then the results are, you know, that's a bonus, but, um, even if it didn't come out good, it's, it was still fun trying and fun, you know, doing something new and different. So. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. Did I ever tell you about the uh, the herb garden I made, where it was? Uh, so I, I made like a garden to grow like basil and mint, and I think a few <laughs> other like easy to grow herbs and like stuff that would weed up <laughs> if you left it alone in a vegetable garden. And um, yeah. I did this um, when I was at a point at work where I was getting really really busy, but sort of unpredictably just on client projects. So mm -hmm. I, it would look like I had, you know, like all the free time in the world. And then I'd be underground for like three weeks trying to get something done for a client. And then I'd be free again for like a week or two. And then I'd be underground <laughs> for like a similar amount of time. So yeah. I, I wanted uh, an indoor herb garden where if I got sucked into like a three week engagement where I couldn't look at it or water it, or you know, touch it yeah. for three weeks, it wouldn't die. So mm -hmm. um, I ended up automating the lights, the water, um, the filtration. I don't know if I ever automated air exchange on that. Uh, I think I was starting to, but I never finished it. But what I ended up with, uh, it would like get overgrown if I would get busy and I would come back and I would have to throw up basil plants because they had gotten flowers on them and stuff, <laughs> you know wasn't the, the best tasting cool. basil after that but yeah it was fun it was kind of just to see if i could do it and definitely yeah it turns out that you know when you push off having to water or anything like that then you just have a new you know maintenance point and that's having to remove flowers <laughs> from your basil <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. So, yeah there's a pretty cool little uh robot out there it's called i, I want to say it's just called the farm bot i don't know if you've seen it it's like a yet. xy gantry uh that you put over like a garden bed right and it it's got a, a camera it'll like finds weeds and plucks them monitors the status like it'll water just the things that need to be watered oh, i awesome. think it would like notify you like your pumpkins are ready to harvest or something like how big be is, like, the, yeah. is the farm that this thing resides over or um it, so i i think you i want to say that it was like maybe four foot by eight foot That's but we, cool. I, there might have been a couple of options it's just a gantry right so it's just so you, you could know, change some lines X. of firmware code foreseeably if you wanted to build a bigger one or i'm whatever. sure yeah oh yeah yeah I, I think that you could couple them together to make longer ones but... that almost yeah. sounds like the early uh fifth season stuff like if you if you know those guys or have been following them mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember when they were building their version one in the CMU Box Club, and it was just a bunch of guys with like aluminum. We're back in Robotney, right? Was there? Yeah, their Robotney. First... Robotney. So the Austin. I like that name. Yeah, I liked Robotney too. Um, got got a kind of a funny outreach from a recruiter from there the other day that said, "Let us discuss fifth season," but with the word lettuce, like oh lettuce, lettuce. yeah, yeah it's gotcha. Cheesy. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, I wonder how many times you've used that pun. 
But it, right. to be honest, trying to come up with a response, like it's not as easy as you would think to come up with a good vegetable pun. Well, that, that's from like the, the one of the oldest, like the, the knock knock joke, right? Like knock knock, who's there? Let us in, it's cold out, right? Like, <laughs> uh, orange, you glad I didn't say banana? Yeah, orange, you glad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's what you should have responded with. It's like, uh, you know, orange, orange, you glad I didn't uh, answer your email. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny. I I had a robot caller today, uh, <laughs> robot spam phone, right? <laughs> and but so this is like the ethical question, right? If if it's a robot caller, shouldn't it be required to inform you that it's not a human, right? Oh, Because like I answer answer the call, and um, you know I say hello and whatever. They introduce themselves and and what they're doing and and like they're calling because. Uh, they're going to help me with the, uh, the money that I owe the IRS. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't, I don't know the IRS any money. Uh, and then like the thing repeats and I'm like, Oh, wait a second. You're not a human. Are you? And it repeats. And I'm like, Oh my God. Like I just wasted 30 seconds. I shouldn't have answered the phone to begin with. The fact that, but the fact that I like started the conversation seconds are pretty awesome though. <laughs> yeah. It, it had me. Yeah, so that's the next one. That's that's pretty but, interesting. Yeah. Do you? But Google do you, has their uh, like voice assistant caller thing that you, you can go online and try this right now to like search for like setting up a restaurant reservation at places that don't do it online. They'll they'll call with their automated assistant, which is it sounds like a person. It, they they even have like pauses and and like things in in the speech to uh, make it seem more human and you you would have no idea so you can have your ai call a restaurant to make a reservation for you that's yeah, yeah. pretty awesome yeah totally yeah yeah it's crazy and and the person on the other end wouldn't know or it right? could also be an ai and and nobody would ever know. or it could be exactly exactly yeah what happens when that's all that's left since the ai is calling the other ai is making restaurant reservations <laughs> maybe some weird all the humans pass. are gone <laughs> ai's are just making them reservations <laughs> yes uh people Man. in old folks homes i haven't been interacted with in three decades <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah i don't know i feel like that's I, I know i shouldn't say this as as a roboticist or whatever but I feel like that's like inappropriate use of automation. Like maybe not, right? I mean, I've mm. I've hired fourteen assistants in my career, so I mean, is that really? I mean, 14. if the robot can do it, you know, like is that really like the worst thing in the world? I guess maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. I feel I feel weird about that one because I, I value human interaction quite a lot, but. I don't know. It's it's weird to be in a position where like my career banks on me being able to sell, you know, to some extent like robots and automation. But then my personal preference is that I never want to talk to a robot on the phone. Right, right, I right. I feel like kind of a hypocrite. Well, <laughs> like I mean, and it's the same, but it's different, right? Like we, we you and I look at the automation from the uh, you know the the physical aspect of replacing things that are repetitive dangerous hard to do require precision uh, require strength you know any of these things that like versus automated phone calls like that's a totally different thing right yeah it's, yeah well i mean it is probably you know, i guess dull. it is repetitive yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but dirty or dangerous i'm not sure yeah <laughs> Right, the, right. The other D's of hustling automation. <laughs> so, so I think every ARM member meeting I went to has has involved the words dull, dirty, and dangerous. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. I guess I guess that's an interesting one for that reason. And yeah, I mean, I, you know, we don't normally look at. Robots as a substitute for human interaction. Where are they? You know, so, <laughs> robot mean, dogs. Yeah, robot elder pets. care. Um, looking at Jibo. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, some of the have you seen any of the AI art stuff lately? Like I've uh, seen a ton of it. Yeah. What do you think? Um, are, are you talking about like the uh, wall uh, Dolly? Dolly, was Dolly like, I was unbelievable with the most. Yeah, oh, that yeah. was really cool. Well, I I think it's all incredible, and it's going to end up really changing the ways that we design a lot of things. Because if you think about it, like you do CAD, right? How, how many times have you sat down in front of uh, the computer to design something in CAD that, like, in your mind, you know exactly what it is, and it, it just takes you all day to get that out onto you know, to get the computer to yeah, agree with you. Right? There's like lofts but, and weird mm. features. And now you change one thing and that breaks your whole SolidWorks feature tree. And, and now you're, yeah. although I don't know, maybe fusion 360 addresses a lot of that, but it's got its own issues. <laughs> but, um, yeah, stability on large assemblies seem to be one. Yeah. We were using that uh, for some stuff at work. A few years ago. But if I could just, uh, you know, instead of having to use my mouse and, and if I can just tell, you know, tell the computer. Just make a bracket uh, that I looks want... like a D, yeah. but with a circle yeah. instead of the inside of the D. So mm -hmm. instead of dicking around in CAD, now you're dicking around with your, uh, your statement that gets parsed into your AI and trying to get that perfect. Yeah, yeah I can see that being a less cumbersome way to do it. Or maybe you also, get like a um, starter CAD, and then from there you get to start start. I mean, with. I think that's just like one kind of example, but maybe a more relatable example to listeners of this podcast would be you know, how many how many pitch decks or proposals or presentations have you put together where you know you spent a couple of hours like trying to find the perfect image that describes what you're <laughs> trying to do. It's a good. Point. Now you don't have to, right? Now you just you go to Dolly and you ask. Describe it. what's in my head. Yeah, and then. Uh, and then it's done, done in however long that takes instead of like searching for yeah, that's a good point. for something that may or may not exist. And even if it didn't exist, now you can make it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, pitch, pitch decks are a pain in the rear. Mm. Yeah. But how many times have you like tried to read an article only to find that it was an AI generated article that just repeated headlines and like a jumbled sort oh. of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, just stick with reputable sources and <laughs> you won't you won't find that uh you know i, I found that came um, up the most when i was like I, I sort of briefly got like addicted to day trading in 2020 um oh god yeah you know I, I lost all my work very quickly and you know the stock market became interesting and so i remember like trying I, to figure out like what's going on with boeing shares today you know and then that was like bait for the just the robo generated article I was like, oh, there you go. Boeing is up at two point six percent. It is up, you know, more than it was the day before, which was three point seven five percent. Yeah, this article yeah. generated by <laughs> right. this AI. Dot, I'm not going to give you any information. Dot com. <laughs> yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. Nice. But I mean, yeah, there's, I guess, okay, so maybe maybe it's not that I don't want to talk to a uh, a robot ever, like when I'm on the phone. Maybe it's that I don't want to talk to a robot that's not capable of passing the Turing test ever when I'm on the phone. Right. So like if, if, if the robot has got skills, like commensurate with that of a human, then I don't mind dealing with the robot. It's just, it's got to be as good at doing the thing as a person. Otherwise, it's like very frustrating to interact with because there now I'm know. a QA department for this robot rather than being a consumer. That's how it is. You're always <laughs> the QA department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, one and the same now, I guess. It's fun. Yep. Yeah. Well, is, there, is there anything else you want to like talk about or plug or... Nothing that comes to mind. It's been a long, productive day. Got a lot of stuff done. Yeah, nice. Good stuff, All man. Right. Well, should we call it? Yeah, this was fun. Yeah, I, I had a good time. It. Thanks for coming on.